let's go somewhere fun today. All right, let's try something new. Hey, what's up guys? My name is Acherno. Welcome back to my C++ series. So today, header files, and we're actually, we're actually out. Started off as a great day, then it started raining, but I decided to get out of town because, so we're here somewhere in Australia, and we're gonna be talking about C++. I hope you guys don't start to think that header files are so boring that I felt the need to just get out of town to cover them. That's just what I just felt like doing. All right, so header files, what are they? Why do we need them? Why do they even exist in C++? A lot of other languages that you might've been used to like Java or C Sharp, they don't actually have header files or any kind of concept of, of, of two different file types where we have our compilation file that we actually compile like a C++ file, a translation unit. And then we also have a header file, which is just this weird kind of file that we always include in places. And why is it even there? Header files are actually much more useful and they're, they're used for much more than just to kind of declare certain declarations that you want to use in multiple CPP files. And as this series kind of goes on, we're just gonna learn so many new concepts that really do require header files in order to work. So don't dismiss them too quickly. As far as the basics of C++ goes, header files are traditionally used to declare certain types of functions so that they can be used throughout your program. If you think back to my C++ compiler and linker videos, I talked about how we need certain declarations to actually exist so that we know what functions and types we have available to us. For example, if we create function in one file and we want to use it in another file, C++ isn't gonna know that that function even exists when we try and compile that other file. So we need a common place to kind of store just declarations, not definitions, because remember, we can only define a function once. We need a common place to store declarations for functions, just declarations, no actual definitions, no body for the functions, but just a place that says, hey, this function exists. Let's take a simple example here. So suppose that I have a function here called log that is supposed to log something to the console. It's going to take in a const char message and it's going to simply see out that message. If I then go ahead and create an additional file, we're gonna call this log.cpp, and then maybe that additional file has something that initializes our log and decides to log something to the console, we're going to get an error because this log function doesn't actually exist in this file. This file doesn't know about the log function. Of course, back in main, here it is. The log function exists fine, and we can actually replace our hello world logging to use that log function. And if I try and compile my program by hitting Control F7, you'll see that it works fine and we don't get any errors. However, back in log, if I try and compile this, we get an error. Because of course, as far as this file is concerned, log doesn't exist. So what does log.cpp actually need in order to not error us? How do we tell it that that log function does actually exist, but it's just defined elsewhere? That is where a function declaration comes in. If we go back to our code here, I need to simply declare that log does exist. If we go back to main and we take a look at this actual signature, you'll see that log is a function that returns void and takes in one parameter, which is a const char pointer. And some child is chasing the kangaroos. <laughs> That's funny. So this is the function signature. We can literally just copy this go back to log.cpp, paste this in, and just close it with a semicolon. The fact that this function doesn't actually have a body means that it is the declaration of the function. We haven't defined what the function actually is, what the function actually does. We've just said, hey, there's a function called log that returns void and takes in a const char pointer. We've, that, that function exists. You can see that our IntelliSense error has gone away, and if I hit Control F7, we do compile. And if I right click on hello world and click build to actually build my program, you can see that it links fine as well because it's, fi it's found that log function. All right, fantastic. So great, we've found a way to actually tell our log.cpp that, that that log function exists somewhere. But what if we make another file? What if, I, what if I make some other file that needs to use this log function? Does that mean that I also have to copy and paste this void log declaration everywhere I go? The answer is yes, you actually do need to do that. However, there is a way to make that easier. Header files, right? What are header files? What are header files traditionally, I should say, because really this is C++, you can, you can do anything with anything. But header files are usually files that get included into CPP files. So basically what we do is we copy and paste the content of header files into CPP files. And we do that via the hash include 
preprocess a directive. So hash include has the ability to copy and paste files into other files, and that is exactly what it seems that we need to do here. We need to copy and paste this log declaration into every file that needs to use that log function. So let's have a go at making a header file. I'm going to right click on header files now. Note these folders here are called filters. They're not actual real folders. I can create a header file under source files. There's going to be a few videos on how Visual Studio works in the future, but for now, just know that these are kind of fake folders. It doesn't matter which one you right click on to create your header file. I'm going to create it under header files because that makes sense, but it doesn't really matter. I'm going to make a header file called log.h. You'll notice that it's straight away inserted some code for me automatically that says hash pragma once. We'll talk about that in just a second. So here I'm going to put in my declaration. I'm going to cut my declaration from the log.cpv file and put it into here, into my header file. So now the idea is this, this header file, log.h, I can include everywhere where I want to be able to use log. And of course, it's going to do for me what I didn't want to do manually, and that is copy and paste this everywhere throughout every file that requires it. I don't want to have to do that copying and pasting myself, so I've basically found a way to kind of make it look a bit tidy and automated to some extent. So back in log.cpp, you can see we get an error now because we're not actually declaring that function. However, if I type in hash include log.h, check that out. We don't get an error and our file compiles. Fantastic. What we can also do is actually include it into main.cpp. Now main.cpp contains the actual definition for the function, so it doesn't really require it. We can call log anyway, but just so you know, it's not going to hurt for us to actually include log.h into here and compile. That's not going to be a problem. All right, so back in log.cpp, you can see we've defined this fantastic function called init log. However, no one actually knows about it except for log.cpp. If I want to be able to call it from main, I'm going to need that declaration. If I call init log over here, it's going to give me an error because that's not declared anywhere. So let's go ahead and add that function signature init log into our log header file. Just like that, fantastic. Make sure that it matches the function signature that you've actually declared in your in your CPP file. So now everything seems well in the world. I'm also going to go ahead and cut and paste this log definition into my log file because that makes a lot more sense. Now I get an error here telling me cout is not found. That's okay, I can just include IO stream. Awesome. So back in main, if I run my program, we can see that we managed to initialize our log and then log hello world to the console. Fantastic. All right, brilliant. So let's go back to that header file and take a look at what that pragma1 statement actually was. So here we have a statement that Visual Studio has seemingly inserted for us called hash pragma1. What is this? So firstly, anything that begins with a hash is known as a preprocessor command or a preprocessor directive. It means that this is going to be evaluated by the C++ preprocessor before this file actually gets compiled. Pragma is essentially an instruction that is sent to the compiler or to the preprocessor. And what pragma once essentially means is that only include this file once. So pragma once is something called a header guard. What it does is it prevents us from including a single header file multiple times into a single translation unit. Now I chose my words there very carefully because you have to understand that it does not prevent us from including our header file into multiple places in our program, just into a single translation unit. So a single CPP file. The reason is that if we accidentally include a file multiple times into a single translation unit, we can get duplicate errors because we'll be copying and pasting that entire header file multiple times. One of the best ways to demonstrate this is if we were to create a struct, for example. If I create a struct here called player, I can leave it empty, it doesn't really matter. If I were to include this file twice into a single translation unit with no header guards, it would actually include that file twice, which means that I would have two structures with exactly the same name, player. We can take a look at this example by commenting out our pragma once, and then back in log, I will include log.h twice. If I try and compile my file, you can see that we get a player struct redefinition error because we're redefining that struct player. We can only define one struct called player. Structs need unique names. So again, you say, Cherno, why would I do this? I'm not a stupid programmer. I'm not as dumb as you think. Why would I include a file twice? Well, young one. This comes back to how include works. Remember how include works is it copies and pastes files into other files, meaning you can create a bit of a chain of includes. So you could have a header file called player, which includes log, then players included in some other file. And then maybe that third file contains every include. So if I create another header file here called common, common is just going to contain some common includes. For example, it will include log. If I go to log.h and make sure that pragma once is commented out and into log.cpp, I include log.h and common.h. If I compile my file, guess what? I still get that error because that struct player is being redefined. If we were to resolve what the preprocessor actually did, you could see that it actually has included log twice. However, back in log.h, if we get rid of that comment and try and compile our file, we don't get an error. 
because it recognizes that log has already been included and it does not include it twice. Now there is one other way that we could add a header guard and I actually kind of like this for teaching purposes because it makes a little bit more sense than some kind of Pragma once, although Pragma once does look a lot cleaner. The traditional way to add header guards is actually via an if def. So what we can do is we can actually type in an if and def and then we can get it to check some kind of symbol, for example log h. We're going to define log h and then at the very end of our file we're going to type in and if. So what this is going to do is first of all check to see if a symbol called log h is actually defined. If it's not defined it's going to go ahead and include the following code in compilation. If this was defined then none of this will be included it'll be all disabled. So once we do pass this initial check, we're going to define log h, which basically means that next time we go through this code, it will be defined, so it will not be repeated. A really easy way to demonstrate this is just to copy and paste this entire file into our log cpp file. And then if we take a look at this, I'll also comment out log.h and common.h. So you can see over here that the first time, this is all fine. It includes the file and everything's okay. And then the second time, it's all grayed out because log h has already been defined. So this kind of header guard is something that was used a lot in the past. However, now we have this new preprocessor statement called pragma once. And so we mostly use that. It doesn't matter which one you use to some extent, although pragma once is a lot cleaner. So it's something that I personally use and it's something that most people do use in the industry. Pretty much every compiler now supports Pragma once, so there isn't, it's not like a Visual Studio only thing. GCC, Clang, MSVC, they all support Pragma once, so don't be afraid to use it. That being said, if you do find legacy code or just code that people have written using different styles, you may encounter this if and def header guard, so just be wary of what it is. But again, I would never write if and def, I would always use Pragma once. The last thing I want to show you is with header guards, we have this kind of discrepancy between include statements. Some include statements use quotes, some include statements use angular brackets. What is the deal? The deal is actually pretty simple. They mean two different things. When we compile our program, we have the ability to tell the compiler of certain include paths. These are basically paths to folders in our computer that contain include files. If the include file that we want to include is inside one of these folders, we can use angular brackets to tell the compiler to search our include path folders. Whereas quotes on the other hand are usually used to include files that are relative to the current file. So for example, if I had a file called log.h that was up one directory from this current log.cpp file, I could use dot dot slash to go back and that would actually go back to a directory because this is relative to this current file. Whereas with angular brackets, they are never relative to this current file. They just have to be in one of the include directories. We'll talk more about setting up include directories and all that in the future. I don't want to complicate things too much, but that's basically the gist of how this works. Now, quotes can also be used to specify files that are relative to include directories that are passed to our compiler. So you can actually use quotes anywhere. I can replace this IO stream to be in quotes and it would totally work. So angular brackets only for compiler include paths, quotes for everything. However, I usually like to use them just for relative paths since you might as well use the angular brackets for something. All right, final thing for today. One other thing that you might notice is this IO stream doesn't actually look like a file because it doesn't contain any extension. It's just called IO stream. What's up with that? Well, it actually is a file. It's just that it doesn't have an extension. This is something that whoever wrote the C++ standard library decided to do to basically separate out C standard library header files and C++ standard library header files. Header files that are in the C standard library will often have a .h extension on the end. However, C++ files do not. So this is just one other way you can differentiate between what is in the C standard library and the C++ standard library, whether or not it has that .h extension. IOStream is a file just like anything else. In fact, in Visual Studio, if we right click on it and hit open documents, you can see that it takes us to this IOStream header file. And if we right click on it on this tab here and hit open containing folder, you'll see where it's actually located on our computer inside this directory. And here it is, that IOStream header file. All right, so that's it, header files, pretty easy. We're gonna be using this extensively in this series. So there'll be plenty of examples to follow. You'll see how I use them. You'll see how you should be using them, but you should now understand how they work and what they're used for. So anyway, I'm gonna get out of here because it's getting really, really cold. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think of this whole, like me going out and doing stuff in, in I mean, this is way more fun. I love traveling, so this is way more fun for me to do than just sitting at home, especially on a Saturday afternoon. 
even though the weather today was pretty bad, so I probably should have just sat home. But anyway, I'm here now. Let me know what you think of this. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm gonna be posting some of the photos I took today on Instagram, so be sure to follow me there. If you really enjoy this series and you wanna see more of these videos, you can support me on patreon.com forward slash the And I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.